We are approaching the point of no return when it comes to us, humans, depending on various systems and devices around us. Many people, including yourselves, write software to control those systems. Are you sure you are doing that in a safe way? It is no longer just chemical plants, planes or trains, which require safety by design. We need to design for safety, always, starting now. Only then, uh, our great ideas and potentials might thrive. We might actually have a commercial self-driving car in the busy city center, transportation drones, or finally, go to Mars. For the first time, we teach safe systems design in an education certificate curriculum, from A to Z, from all key concepts and ideas to practical hands-on work. Learn functional safety with us. If you are setting up or leading a company or a team and you want to bring your digital solutions such as algorithms or other software modules to the industrial world or in particular to the automotive industry, you must have hit the wall of specific procedures and standards required for qualification. You are required to develop and design in a specific way to achieve safety of your solutions when applied to critical products such as fully autonomous cars. Your engineers may be puzzled with notions such as ASPIs or ASO levels and how those apply to your products and software in them. For the first time, we cover these items in an education certificate curriculum from A to Z, from all key ideas and concepts to the practical hands-on work. Learn functional safety with us. I came to the project where we needed to select a hardware platform and system software to support autonomous driving operations. Of course, being highly software driven, we selected the best GPUs, FPGAs for specific real-time tasks, embedded Linux of course. Little did we know that once it all runs, and it did actually, the demos were really great, that it shall not fail, ever, or if it shall fail, it shall fail safely. We learned the hard way about reliability, fit, fault tolerant designs, and functional safety overall. This was more than five years ago, and I was simply drawn into this world of safe designs and safe systems, and this became my life. For the first time, we covered these items in an education certificate curriculum from A to Z. From all key ideas and concepts, to practical hands-on work. Learn functional safety with us. Learn functional safety with us. Learn functional safety with us. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me. And welcome to the webinar, the joint webinar of University of California, San Diego and NIT Academy. Uh, the topic of uh, today, and we are all gathered uh, here today to figure out uh, uh, whether uh, the world will stay safe after everything goes digital. So we witnessed the digitization in all the industries, so in the, in the automotive industry, uh, in the uh, industrial uh, plants, uh, in smart cities, so software and hardware and electronics uh, started to engulf everywhere and basically uh, what happens now, so whether we are endangered by it and uh, which standards and which approaches we need to take to, to really uh, keep, uh, keep us all safe and keep all the solutions we develop uh, okay. Um, so before we uh, start the, the story for today, uh, I would like to ask you to mark your presence at today's webinar. Uh, each uh, uh, person present here uh, will uh, get a discount voucher for one of the courses uh, if he or she decided, decides to participate. So in the chat, you can find the link. Actually, this is, this is exactly that link. So it is, it is one survey on SurveyMonkey, a very short one. Just fill in your details so that we, uh, we know that, that you are here and that uh, you are basically interested in, um, in these kind of topics so we can communicate with you easily later on. And of course, grant you a discount voucher. 
Before any further ado, uh, first let's uh, introduce ourselves. So I will start with me. My name is Milan, Milan Bielic. I'm a professor uh, at the Faculty of Technical Sciences, uh, University of Novi Sad. I'm also CEO of NIT Institute and a functional safety instructor uh, in the University of California, San Diego. And today I'm uh, giving this uh, webinar in the capacity of a functional safety instructor. So I hope you're going to enjoy that. Uh, the introduction for you that are on the call uh, is going to be done a little bit differently. Uh, I would like that uh, every single one of you introduces uh, by assigning to a team. So here we have four teams that are going to be competing throughout this webinar. It will not, not, not going to be difficult, so don't, don't worry. So you don't need to go off the call now. So it's, <laughs> it's not going to be difficult. It's not going to be by name, so it's going to be pretty anonymous, but still, it, it will be interesting and it will give the pace to, to, the, to the webinar. So the team blue, uh, the team blue is actually the team uh, that uh, will consist of all the people that have a, have a primarily software background. So if you feel like software is your main thing, any kind of software basically, uh, even if you do more than software, if you feel that the software is, let's say, what you do mostly, then you're team blue. So the team red is for people uh, that uh, see themselves as hardware and electronics oriented uh, persons. So if you are hardware or, or electronics oriented, then you're team red. Uh, team green is for people that are uh, oriented towards mechanical engineering and mechanical uh, systems and components and uh, people that are into processes, project management, quality assurance, uh, um, process models, different other support are the team yellow. So just for me to get the feeling about what is the, uh, let's say, distribution currently, uh, I will just run one poll so that you can select the team. It shall pop up immediately at your end. So you can mark uh, what kind of team you are. Wait a bit more. Okay, so we have software people, hardware people. We don't have anyone in the mechanical background yet. Okay, so we have the QA and PM people. So we do have three teams, so that's good. Blue, red, and yellow teams are here. Okay, I will end the poll. So you can now see the results uh, of, of the poll. So we have a little bit more software than hardware people, but I think it's enough so that these teams can communicate with within this, this webinar and participate hopefully in, in, uh, in the tasks. Okay, so let's go further. Uh, before we start, I'm going to uh, introduce this topic about functional safety and system safety in general by showing you a footage that was recorded by an Uber vehicle. That was the infamous Tempe accident. So the self-driving car, autonomous vehicle, actually killed a cyclist that was acting as a pedestrian at that moment. And uh, this is, this is the actual footage uh, that, uh, that was given to, to the police so that you can, you can see actually what was the situation. So let's watch that for a second. Okay, so the question is why Uber failed in Tempe in Arizona. Uh, one of the, of course, a little bit of a clarification, the vehicle that was used by Uber is a self-driving vehicle. So the driver that you saw in the, in the footage uh, is safety driver. So the, the, the main intention of this driver is only to intervene if and when something goes wrong with the vehicle. If everything is fine, this driver should not do anything basically. So the, the goal is just to correct the car or to intervene in case of any, uh, uh, bad situations that might that might happen, and the question for you all here and for the for us all in this call is to try to figure out uh, 
who or what is to blame for this accident? What do you think? Is it the Uber technology in the car? Is it this particular safety driver or, or the cyclist? So let's, let's see in the poll. Uh, again, what do you think uh, that, that was uh, the most uh, to blame uh, for the accident? Let's see. Let's wait a bit more. Okay, I think we can end it now. Uh, and I can share the results with you. So uh, the most of you thought that the Uber technology in the car was to blame. Uh, that is also uh, one of the common uh, problems, whether the Uber technology was to blame or the safety driver was to blame. Uh, unfortunately, the safety driver did uh, sustain uh, the, the, the criminal uh, penalty in the court. But uh, then the question again is, uh, what was, yeah, the, the attention was not there, that's for sure, we, we, we saw the, the footage. But then again, uh, how come that the technology that is full with, as you can see in this figure, that is full with sensors, uh, driver assistance, controllers, computers, etc., failed to see this, this cyclist and to uh, do the emergency braking as one of the, one of the most common functions there. Uh, okay, gives you gives you a bit of, of a glimpse uh, on a question: Is the technology safe? So how how can we make sure that the technology is safe? So this is the the, the system safety and functional safety uh, field all about. So how do we understand if something is safe? How do you figure out how to design for safety? So if you look uh, at this comic. Actually, uh, those managers don't have any problems with this power plant uh, because uh, it didn't report any accident, only that they figure out uh, once they visit it that it's actually closed. So the technology that is not working is actually not, we don't need to do anything with it. So one, one uh, way to keep things safe is not to operate them. And that's the obvious safety measure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what we don't want, we don't want our, safe, our vehicles uh, uh, and uh, our technology not to be used so that that be the scrutiny of the, uh, of, the, of the world, that this technology shouldn't be used. So we want to use the technology. So that's, that's, the, that's the purpose. So let's see how can we uh, make uh, the technology so that it can be used. Uh, there is a notion of inherently safe development. So to develop... Uh, the, the system in a way that we can say it's inherently safe, so that we did everything we could to make it safe. Uh, system safety and functional safety as a field deal with that a lot through various standards uh, that are prescribed for the purpose. Uh, functional safety standards are shown in this uh, illustration. So IEC 61508 is the mother of them all. So this is the main functional safety standard that uh, everything else derives from. And the concepts are very similar uh, across those standards. So I will share a few words about those concepts in a second. As you can see here, depending on the, the industry, uh, there are tailorings, different tailorings to this main standard. Uh, let's say uh, I think that most of the audience is from the automotive world, that is ISO 26262 here, as you can see, and the safety of the intended functionality, this is SODIF. So these two standards and mainly ISO 26262 is something that needs to be regarded for automotive. But for different other fields, you have different uh, standards, like for the process industry, IC 61501, for the machines and plants, what is very interesting for industrial, for industrial IoT, for the um, smart cities and smart factories, uh, this ISO 13849 and IC 62061. So these two standards are also very much regarded, but uh, most of the concepts are very similar across the standards. Uh, what the standards uh, basically require from our systems is to show something that is called safety integrity. Safety integrity means resistance against dangerous failures. So the systems may fail in different ways. So it may produce erroneous results. It may, you know, like show something bad on screen or do, do whatever is not intended. But sometimes these failures can be dangerous, like in the Tempe accident, failing to actually apply the brake. So if we have a dangerous failure, uh, that means that uh, this system uh, probably does not have enough level of, of safety integrity. Uh, so this is the one of the main, let's say, terminology in the system and functional safety is safety integrity. And we have two uh, parts of that that I'm going to share with you. 
uh, one is systematic safety integrity, and the other is safety integrity against random failures. Uh, these are ultimately different things, but I would like you to just based on the terminology here uh, and on these wordings, systematic safety integrity and safety integrity against random failures, I want you to try to imagine what this might be. So the systematic safety integrity first. So uh, now we are going to have our first question for our teams, uh, in which teams are going to compete. So uh, one question is for each of the teams. So first I'm going to ask the software team. This is team blue in one poll. So don't answer this question if you're not the software team. So the Zoom doesn't make any distinction. So if you're not software team, so don't answer this question. If you're the software team, then please answer this question that is going to appear now. Okay, I will end it now. Now, before sharing the results, let's go to Team Red, Hardware and Electronics. Here's a question for Team Red. It will pop up in a second. So Team Red, Hardware Electronic People, still reading true, probably. Okay, that's it for the Team Red. And we are now going to Team Yellow, a question, first question for Team Yellow. Okay, thank you, Team Yellow. Let's see now the results. So let's see first for, for software, I will share how you voted. So basically the question was what systematic safety integrity assumes for software? So what does it mean for software? And the correct answer here is definitely strict adherence to the required process model way of working. So the systematic safety integrity is actually all about the way of working. So how we uh, do things, uh, are we doing the things in the right way? And the standards uh, usually reference other standards that prescribe process models. They tell us what to do first, what to do next, how to do things, how to document things, and how to cover uh, the complete landscape of the work correctly. So this is uh, the systematic safety integrity. If we can show that we uh, followed this processes and procedures, then it is uh, much, much less likely that we, that we have uh, what is called here systematic faults. This means that uh, our software has bugs or our designs have flaws or that we failed to list some of the requirements, etc. What uh, effectively is one of the common uh, problems for safety, let's say that the requirements are not specified correctly, etc. Let's see now the uh, how the, uh, the, the Harvard team answered. Then again, it's about demonstrating planning, execution, and other project phases with item level traceability. So basically it's the same. So following the process, uh, of course, uh, burn-in testing is uh, interesting and it's some, sometimes required, but it does, doesn't have much to do with uh, systematic safety integrity. Uh, also the reliability has nothing to do with systematic safety integrity. So that is, that is the, the, the question here. And we have the, QA team. 
So here we have a point. So we'll have the point for the yellow team because they got it right. So making sure that everybody adheres to the required systematic working process is the goal for QAPM roles and safety managers, basically to make sure that everything runs according to what the standards should be doing, but not doing the work instead of other people. Uh, so it's definitely not that they should respect only uh, the regulations and the standards in their own work. And uh, of course, the roles are required, but uh, definitely not, not the only thing that is that is uh, needed uh, to make sure that we have systematic safety integrity fulfilled. Okay, so the team yellow leads by one currently. Uh, so let's see, uh, okay, so the systematic safety integrity in, a, uh, in the end is all about the process. So this is one of the processes that are commonly used. It's a V model that has all the phases from the requirements definition for the top level, then for the software, architectural design, drill down into details, implementation, and then on the right side is the testing corresponding to each of the phases. And of course, going from one phase into another, we need to provide links and linking up these phases and all the items in them is called traceability. So basically this is one of the very important terms. And when we look at the standards, the standards also tell us for some parts, let's say here for the software, uh, what systematic integrity methods we exactly shall use uh, to fulfill certain levels of safety. Here we see four levels of safety. ACLD in automotive ISO 26262 is the highest level of safety that might be required. It might also be lower than that. So depending on which safety level we are uh, targeting, we will here uh, be a prescribed different, um, let's say, different ways how the software shall be done, like we shouldn't use interrupts if we want to have an ACLD solution, uh, we shouldn't uh, create monolithic designs if we go anywhere above ACLA or even for ACLA it is recommended, of course you can use everything for every level but then again it's about the time that you invest into the product. Uh, so uh, these things are prescribed by the standards to, to some extent. Uh, to tell you what and how you shall behave depending on the, the required level of safety with regard to the systematic safety integrity. As a conclusion, safety integrity against systematic failures, that is systematic safety integrity, uh, deals with failures which are not random in nature, and it seeks to prevent faults in specifications and design, faulty processes in documentation, software bugs, and other design time faults which can be laid and hidden so they can manifest during the use of the product because we made a mistake somewhere along the way uh, during the processes and procedures. So this process makes sure that these things like faults uh, during the, the, our design and development are not there or that the probability of having them is minimized. Now let's see the safety integrity against random failures. So now this is, this is uh, another part. So we'll again uh, use, uh, use some polls. Uh, let's see uh, now the question Q2 for first we are going to start from the uh, one question that is both for hardware and mechanical so this is here just for the red team okay let's see so what do you think safety integrity against random failures Nobody would dare. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Somebody still wants to participate. Let's wait a bit. Okay. Let's end it here. Now let's see the software people. So the the blue team. Question two for the blue team. This is a multiple choice, so you can select more than one here.
Okay. We can, okay, still answers are coming in. Okay, we can end it here. Okay, and let's see the team yellow, question two about the safety integrity against random failures. Okay, let's end this poll in a second. Okay, ending it now. Let's see now what the, what the uh, teams red and green have answered. So the question was safety integrity against random failures for hardware mechanical components means that all failures can be fixed through redesign, eliminating effects of randomness. Uh, this is exactly what is not the safety integrity against random failures about. Instead, it's about that our final design must meet the required quantifiable reliability targets. So uh, the random failures are actually the failures that uh, stem from uh, the effects uh, of the nature, uh, let's say wear and tear of the material, um, different effects like crosstalk, electronic interference, something like this. Uh, this is very much relevant for the hardware and mechanical components, uh, since the mechanical components definitely have a number of cycles that they can be used. They have uh, some forces they can occur, uh, they can sustain. Also, the electronic components uh, have different temperature ranges in which they operate. They'll, they also uh, can have the number of cycles or the time where uh, dur durability, basically, uh, and the wear interval where they simply will wear out. Uh, you heard of terms such as failure in time fit or MTTF or some other terms that usually can be found in the data sheets of the manufacturers. So this is exactly what the system safety asks uh, of your designs. Uh, when we speak about safety integrity against random failures, it's all about making sure that, we, that uh, our hardware electronics meets the required reliability targets, meaning that it will endure for 10,000 hours, 100,000 hours, uh, et cetera, with uh, the level of reliability that is actually a probability of survival, that our system is going to still be alive after some period of time. And it is usually required that these failure rates will be very, very, very small, meaning that the reliability is 0 0.999999, let's say, or the failure rates 10 to the power of minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, depending on the safety integrity level that we want to achieve. Uh, let's see the software, how the software people answer it. So it has traditionally randomness has nothing to do with software. So nobody opted for this answer, but basically, uh, believe it or not, it's true because the randomness, the true randomness has nothing to do with software. So everything that you perceive as being random in software is actually quasi random. So there's always a bug or meaning a fault somewhere in the design that causes these quasi random effects. So basically this randomness is something that can be uh, avoided uh, by this quasi randomness can be avoided by following the systematic safety integrity principles. Uh, however, this is true that we can detect random failures of electronics or whatever else uh, by the help of software, so that, that's true. But then again, these random failures are in electronics, in hardware, in mechanical components. So these are different fault-tolerant mechanisms that can be used for that. And uh, yeah, this third one is definitely not, not, not true, although it looks like that and uh, it's our inherent experience. Uh, However, there is this field around AI that is currently under dispute that might be regarded as random, but is still not modeled uh, in, the, in the standards. So when it comes to functional safety st standards currently and system safety standards, the software is considered not having anything to do with random failures, but instead it's regarded only as, as, uh, as for the systematic safety integrity. Okay, and let's see the, the third. 
Uh, for the QA team, uh, of course, uh, and for the safety managers, there must be evidence in documentation with numbers, so quantifiable, that the values that specified by the standards mean failure rates, uh, safe failure fraction, diagnostic coverage, and everything else that deals with this kind of randomness and these uh, reliability uh, properties, all these numbers need to be uh, documented, need to be uh, stemming from either data sheets, documentation, or tests, and it shall be uh, presentable in the safety case. So this is this is uh, this is the true answer. Uh, so if we look at here, I think that basically nobody got it right this time. Let's see what was for the first question. Or a mechanical? Yeah, I think we cannot grant any points, and this so the yellow team still leads by one point. Okay, uh, so the random failures, let's do a quick recap now. These are some excerpts from the standards. These are the actual numbers that are given as targets. Let's say if automotive AC level means the level of safety that we need to achieve, ACLD being the most strict, we see that the failure rate allowed is the smallest, so 10 to the power of minus eight. So uh, when converted to fit value, so this is times 10 to the power of nine, it's 10, so for easier, easier understanding. So 10 fit is ACLD boundary, 100 fit is ACLC boundary, et cetera, et cetera. Different standards like the uh, mother standard in the functional safety also defines safety integrity level SILs. You can see it's, it's very similar. It says what are the boundaries that the dangerous failures per hour here needs to, needs to um, fulfill uh, so that we can regard them as compliant. And this of course needs to be documented. So in the end, to conclude, the random failures happen due to the manufacturing material fatigue, wear and tear, as well as environmental influences like interferences, which mostly affect mechanical and hardware electronic components. Random failures must be quantified and compared with the required values from the functional safety standards. Uh, some of the numbers are reliability, failure probability, failure rates, mean time to failure, failures in time, safe failure fraction, diagnostic coverage, um, etc. So th these are the, the variables that you need to calculate. And of course, there's a, a huge discipline dealing with that. But how do we know which ACL do we need in the first place? So this is, uh, this is an interesting question to, to answer. So there's a phase also prescribed by uh, safety standards called hazard analysis and risk, risk assessment. This is the, the title from the ISO 26262, but it can be similar in different other standards. Uh, and this is basically the table that the standard gives. Uh, about quantifying uh, the, the risk that a hazard exists. So the hazard is actually an imagined situation. So we are starting by hazard analysis. We are imagining all the situations that our system may be in. And then for each imagined situation, we decide what is the severity in case of uh, some actuating events. Uh, let's say severity can be the outcome of the, has of the hazardous event. Uh, being that no injuries, light and moderate injuries as to severe and life-threatening injuries with the probable survival and the life-threatening injuries with the uncer uncertain survival. So these are S0 to S3. Then we have the exposure uh, because the, in, in safety, it's all about severity and probability. So if the severity is high, but the probability is very, very low, then it's better than vice versa, let's say or both when, when both are high. Here in ISO 26262 in this HARA, we have exposure given here uh, as a probability of encountering a situation. E0 means that it can never happen. We are never exposed to that uh, as uh, pedestrians or drivers. E1 with very low probability up to once a year. E2 is few times a year. E4 is high probability at al almost every drive. So basically this is the uh, so uh, these are the, the quant quantifiers for the exposure. Um, and the controllability is, uh, of course, here assuming that we have the driver. So if the drivers, driverless vehicles are in question, then it's always C3, difficult to control or uncontrollable. Meaning that if we are exposed to a situation that happens, we might make an evasive maneuver that will help us save our, our lives. If more than 90% of drivers can avoid the situation, uh, less than 90% uh, of drivers can avoid the situation, then it's C3, the worst controllability. And then if 90 to 99% can avoid the C2, C1 is 99% of average drivers, uh, like most of the drivers can avoid. And C0 is that it's 
uh, avoidable by default. So basically everyone can avoid it. So if you have C0, we don't have a hazard. Uh, if we have S0, we don't have a hazard. If we have E0, we don't have a hazard. If you have different other combinations of parameters, like say S2, E2, and C3, then we decide that our system must be ACLA, meaning that the systematic safety integrity and safety integrity against random failures, whatever the standard prescribes, must adhere to ACLA parts of that standards in all those tables that you saw. So this is basically uh, what needs to be done in this hazard analysis and risk assessment. It's a very thorough phase. It has a process how it's being done that we don't have time to discuss thoroughly, but we can now get ready for the question three for the teams. And we will select one of the typical functions we are all probably aware. It's called adaptive cruise control function in a typical passenger vehicle. We need to determine the ACL level. So the uh, adaptive cruise control function to remind you is some kind of, um, uh, is a function that's usually used on highways that maintains the distance between you and the next in the adjacent vehicle uh, that can break automatically, basically, and keep the throttle. Uh, so this is the adaptive cruise control, keeping the throttle and automatically braking. So it's a bit different than cruise control, which is just keeping the throttle. So you still steer, but the throttle is being kept. And the adaptive cruise control, if there is an obstacle in front of you, the vehicle is going to slow down a bit. So it's, it's the function. So now we need to determine what is the severity in case we have a failure in this adaptive cruise control function that is all of a sudden it stops working. Uh, we of course regard the scenario that we have the driver that might retake the driving and continue the driving. So we can assume the controllability and we can also judge the exposure. So uh, the answer is going to be written in chat. So just write A, B, C, or D in chat, and we will we will see uh, the fastest and the correct uh, answer in chat gets points for the team. So let's see how you're going to deal with this. Let's take a minute or two for this. So I hope you see this table in the screen. Okay, Nino says it's something. It's ACLB, everyone sees that, but of course there is no judgment. So Nino might be right, might be wrong. I think here for each of the selections, we must provide the argumentation for that. It's not easy to define. It's sometimes not straightforward. The lower the ACL, the, the cheaper for the company to develop. So the, the, the management would like to have as low ACL as possible. We can always say ACLD and be safe, but it's very expensive. So we shouldn't aim to higher than use, but, but the, the standard shall be respected. Okay. Shall we allow a bit more time? See the last 30 seconds for this. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and the time is up. So let's see how some people did this for different functions and AC levels. So this is the excerpt from different sources. To be honest, it's very, very hard to find out somewhere in the literature which are the AC levels. Uh, we, we managed to source from different projects. So if 
we look here, adaptive cruise control is judged to be a C. It says that the uh, it's three, uh, three, four, and two, we can analyze here. So three means life-threatening in injuries. Uh, four is for the exposure. So it means uh, at almost every drive. And so this is here. And uh, it is deemed to be too normally controllable. 19 or 99% of the people can avoid. It's usually used with higher speeds. So this is not, uh, this is why it's not simply controllable because all of a sudden it fails. So not everyone is going to cope with the situation depending on the distance you keep with the other vehicles. So it is judged to be normally controllable in, in this case. Uh, however, uh, everyone might be right in some, in some of the argumentation. Uh, it's still that the argumentation is to be convincing. And this is something uh, you uh, need to provide uh, from uh, the abundance of experience and the examples and testing and everything. And numbers, sheer number, numbers, what does it mean? Exposure, controllability, how you prove that, et cetera. And you show that to auditors. So now we did, let's say, uh, an exercise that we invented basically out of the blue, the answer. Uh, but we will grant points to uh, those that answered ACL D because it's always better in safety to be more conservative than less conservative. So the first one was Nebuisha. And uh, I believe Nebuisha is Harvard team. So we can give to the green team one point. So now the uh, the yellow and the, and the green team are the same, basically. So have each team has one point. Let's see further. Uh, so about this uh, hazard evaluation, uh, there is a full uh, field of safety engineering that uh, provides a safety process. This is only a part of the safety process. It starts with the hazard identification. So we need to figure out which hazards are there. Uh, and this is a very hard phase. We need to have uh, a list of hazards, uh, first the preliminary hazard list and a hazard list that we groom all the time. Then we do the risk analysis for all of the hazards and evaluate the risk doing HARA. And then we judge whether the risk is, is acceptable. Uh, judging the acceptability of risk depends on various things. It depends on the field we are in. It, it depends on the standard. It depends on the legislation. It sometimes depends on the sheer uh, acceptability, risk as acceptability uh, theories like minimum endogenous mortality, you can look it up. Uh, if we judge the risk is acceptable, then we can close the hazard. If the risk is not acceptable, if it's too high, then we uh, try to avoid the risk or reduce the risk by applying different measures for that and uh, or to remove the hazard, to re-specify, to do different things. We'll discuss this in a minute. And then we go uh, in circles until we basically close all the hazards from the, from the list. If the risk is acceptable, uh, we can close, uh, if, if the hazard is still in, but the risk is acceptable, it is always acceptable with some level of integrity that is required for the system. So we can say this risk is acceptable, but the safety integrity level that we need to have for this particular implementation is ACLC or ACLD. So if the implementation is ACLC, with this hazard and this assessment there, then we can close the hazard. So if the system is not ACLC, this, flat, this hazard is not closed and we need to specify some additional measures until we can show that the hazard is closed. So this is just a part of the safety process. And the safety is all about the processes and inherent safety processes. One of the newer things in the last one or two decades uh, was proliferating that is proactive safety instead of being reactive instead of waiting for the crash and then analyzing the black box we are doing uh, proactively everything we can to prevent uh, to prevent uh, problems later how the hazards can be closed so we can remove the hazards altogether it is possible uh, if we re-specify the functional behavior, let's say one common way to do that is to decrease the allowed speed of the vehicle. Let's say if, if we decrease the speed, then the, probably the injuries are going to be fewer or, or uh, the problems there is not going to are not going to happen. And therefore we will have lower AC levels. So if we simply decrease the speed, maybe uh, our implementation is going to be good. Uh, if we cannot do that, uh, we can apply different safety measures like passive safety, again, dealing with uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, non-functional things like uh, safety belts or airbags 
or in, in the vehicles, or let's say if it's a factory, it's, there's signage everywhere or fencing. We simply don't allow people to enter somewhere. Uh, making, let's say, pathways that are, uh, that are uh, wide enough, et cetera. So th this, is, this is passive safety consideration. But what is uh, interesting here for this talk is active safety. So the functional safety where we actually seek to have measures to uh, actively, uh, by means of safety functions, uh, protect the system. And uh, this means, for example, one of the common safety functions, if something overheats, let's say, then turn off the power. This is one of the common, common safety functions. Then if you have these safety functions, uh, then the, the system that does overheat is out of the question any longer. So basically the system under consideration, uh, you can try to uh, bring the safety integrity very high for this system uh, to make sure that the temperature never goes above a certain threshold. But it seems it's very, very hard to do. Instead, if we are able to create a safety function, that in case of the temperature threshold being breached, just turns off the power, then instead of proving the integrity of the complete system, we just prove the integrity of the safety related system, meaning that the system that implements our safety functions. So only this subsystem needs to be checked. And of course, the integrity of this subsystem is sometimes also not easy to, uh, to, to uh, verify and these subsystems can also be very complex so usually consists of different sensors maybe cameras maybe whatever whatnot uh, exist there uh, and uh, here you can bring up this uh, the safety integrity if uh, you calculate it being low in the sense of reliability uh, mostly by applying different fault tolerance principles there's a whole field it's highly mathematical that deals with fault tolerance uh, that we teach also at the UCSD uh, that uh, you can use to try to either increase the redundancy or provide diversity or provide uh, different diagnostic mechanisms, etc. Uh, and then to uh, calculate basically whether you achieved uh, what you should be achieving. Recalculation of everything. And uh, of course, even the, those safety functions can be decomposed. One of the common examples of decomposition is actually this example of Tempe. So we have the system that drives and should be braking for the emergency. So this emergency braking can be regarded as a safety function. But actually, uh, if the system fails, then we have the safety driver that should intervene. So we basically transfer the responsibility from the emergency braking uh, function to the safety driver. And then formally looking safety driver is the part of the system. And let's say uh, enforcing the safety function uh, by, by human uh, intervention so being part of the system basically it's not it's not unusual that the human is a part of the system so through decomposition to the safety driver uh, then you need to provide to, to make sure you have uh, evaluated the integrity only for the small hardware that detaches the main computer from the from operation and gives back the control to the driver and this small hardware usually can be aclc or aclb certified so in this case uh, usually we, we, we seek ways to decompose stuff to make sure that we can uh, transfer the responsibility to something that is smaller so that it is easier to uh, attest for the safety, uh, safety integrity, easier to calculate and easier to design. The problem is, of course, if we want to have a fully driverless vehicle, then this decomposition to have something smaller to take over is not there anymore. The question is, what is taking over? And then there might be different theories, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's what, what not. So it's, it's very, very hard to, to, uh, to conclude. Uh, and then we have this question, who will be to blame? So we have two approaches currently. So we have a conservative approach that is currently being used in Europe. Uh, it's all about safety standards. So we take the safety standard. This is ISO 26262, do everything by the book according to the systematic safety process, uh, providing the systematic safety integrity, then calculating whatever we need to calculate and designing the system uh, that we have this safety integrity against random failures in place, that the all numbers are correct, correct uh, according to the specification. Uh, by doing that, Europe reached uh, level three at the test grounds. So uh, this is uh, the current situation in Europe. In USA, for example, we have a disruptive approach where, yeah, the, the standards are respected, but still the judging whether the uh, standards uh, are, <laughs> are going to be used for final, for final uh, approval is actually not there. 
Uh, instead, the USA seeks to uh, have the statistical proofs of the final vehicles, judging that the number of fatalities that uh, are connected with the autonomous or fully autonomous vehicles is much lower than the number of fatalities caused by the human drivers. So this is a quirky approach in which uh, this system safety and functional safety engineering is put aside a bit. And instead, we are playing a sheer, let's say, vaccination, like a COVID-19 game, something like this. Uh, maybe somebody would die from the uh, safety uh, function not working uh, and from the self-driving cars, but then some more people are going to be saved. Uh, for me, it's a bit problematic because I would be averaged to every other driver because I would not be driving anymore in a fully driverless vehicle. Uh, so if I'm a good driver, then uh, I have the problem with this. If you are a bad driver, then probably you are better off being served by the self-driving technology. So this is one of the ways to judge whether the risk is acceptable. Let's say, uh, although the current application of currently existing standards do not allow the, the deployment of these technologies. So what do you believe? I will now ask you, this is not a quiz question, but it, it's interesting. Uh, who is to blame here? So uh, which approach is something that you would rather take? Is this conservative approach like in Europe? Is it disruptive approach? Or the third option, maybe we need something else. Okay, I will share the results. So conservative approach. Yeah, this is what I'm also closer, closer to thinking that we should really continue doing this. this the, the only problem with this approach is that we don't have enough money to do it. So now the question is who is going to continue this heavy investment? Maybe it's going to be like the nuclear uh, fusion. It's always for nuclear fusion, it's always 30 years away. And here the self-driving cars are, are always five years away. So the problem is, is with that. But somebody uh, answered, maybe we need something else and maybe sharing a thought. So can we hear from you, whoever answered this? Do you want to share a thought or two on this? One of the approaches, uh, that is um, that that uh, can be uh, can be applied here is to go go conservative, but to put much much more uh, on the passive infrastructure so that uh, you have the conditions in which the vehicles operate that are not mimicking the current conditions, meaning that you have a complete different orchestration of traffic in the cities, so that autonomous vehicles can. Uh, be much safer there, meaning that they have dedicated lanes or have uh, protective, uh, let's say, curbs or something like this, in which or going lower speeds, but dedicated lanes, keeping the operation still appropriate, but not as dangerous. But for the normal passenger vehicles, it will still be a bit difficult. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm happy that the group here in this webinar is, uh, let's say, uh, is ready to, to embrace the safety culture and the, the culture in which we all understand basically the safety uh, and uh, nurture safety and uh, you use the safety mindset in, in our everyday work. And it's all about knowledge in the end of the day. So the knowledge as the key to safety is something that we advocate at the UCSD, at the NIT Academy as well. So we want to really make sure that everyone is knowing uh, how the safety is handled correctly. And currently in the situation where we uh, have uh, tons of, uh, uh, tons of different, uh, uh, tons of uh, different people, engineers, new engineers pouring in, in all these, these uh, uh, safety critical industries with little or no clue about safety. We don't have any safety subjects in the, um, in our faculties on software engineering fields, even in the mechanical electrical engineering, you have a bit about reliability, but not actually all these kind of safety things and safety standards to the extent that is needed. 
Uh, I will here give you a few words uh, and then we are going to jump to QA uh, that uh, we, we will start in a few minutes as scheduled. Uh, and then we'll answer also the questions that pop up in the chat. Uh, Functional safety fundamentals for automotive is the certificate that now runs for the second year uh, by the UCSD. And uh, it consists of five courses in this FSBA uh, round. So uh, these courses are going to teach you in detail what I was discussing today in this webinar. So the course on systems functions and safety is actually mandatory for everyone, I would say, because it's the course where you would be uh, introduced and also to in, in some part uh, practically introduced to uh, how the systems shall be regarded, what about the system requirement, what about the big picture, what about the processes, the traceability, what about the safety so and functional safety, so all important terminology. How do you actually make sure that you fulfill uh, systematic safety integrity? How do you make sure that you fulfill uh, safety integrity against random failures, what the standards say there, and also to do exercises that will help you along the way. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a top level uh, subject, not drilling too much into details, but giving you enough starting ground so that you can live and work safety every day, regardless of your actual position in the company. Uh, then we have a couple of additional courses, fault tolerance systems, actually tells you how to design systems that maybe are not uh, at start are not adequate, adequately safe, what to do with them to make them safe. So how to create dependable systems, uh, how to implement various fault tolerant mechanisms. It's a system design uh, subject and you learn how to calculate all those numbers. All those funky numbers that I was mentioning, this is the place where you can learn how to actually calculate all, all that. Safety analysis techniques is an in-depth tape to hazard evaluation and risk assessment. And it's also on the component level. So you figure out what are exact uh, reliability figures and the behavior of your components and your systems, doing different uh, methods for that, being that FMEDA, FMEKA, ETA, uh, VISMA, or different other methods. So here, I think uh, Vlada Marinkovic goes uh, through five or six methods that you can apply in your everyday work to figure out whether a component you selected is appropriate for integration. And this is very important because once you select the component, later on, it's very hard to replace this component with another one, specifically with respect to systematic safety integrity that you cannot longer prove. So if you change the design, then you need to redo all the steps in the middle and it's very hard to replace. So these analysis and uh, this starting work is very, very important. Then uh, one key subject on understanding the process. So it's all about systematic safety integrity. It's called automotive quality and project management. It's all about a SPICE standard and also ISO 9001 as a, as a precursor of it. Uh, you will get all what is needed to understand the processes to be able to apply it correctly. It's also for everyone, basically, not only for the process people. And in the end of the day, the subject that will go and dissect the standard in, the, in, in details here for automotive, uh, variant, ISO 26262, and also SOTIP to some extent, now going directly through the standard and now understanding and drilling down into every aspect of it because you have all the, the underlying foundation for really understanding what the standard is all about instead of just reading it as a, as a manual without actual clue what to do with all these things inside. So this is, let's say, one of the most complete and but still minimal uh, curricula for the functional safety, system safety and functional safety that exists out there. There's, uh, there are some extended subjects also, if somebody is interested to drill down deeper, uh, to uh, learn how to uh, design uh, technical safety concepts in detail for the automotive, to learn how to write software in different level of details that have all the safety mechanisms in place and uh, what can be done about safety and specifically in coding. So this is a programming uh, topic. Then uh, how do you create verification and validation strategies, unit testing, how do you provide coverages, which methodologies for testing are used, used uh, in detail, and also how to compose a convincing safety case. So this is uh, in-depth take here in this topic. And in the end, we have one interesting project that you can apply all what you learned in uh, a real world autom automotive functional safety project. Uh, there are also additional courses relevant for automotive that the UCSD and NIT Academy are, are giving. This is a general introduction to automotive, speaking about vehicle networks and infrastructure, 
uh, programming for automotive uh, through the OTSR stack, testing the ECUs uh, using the actual testing equipment for Vector, let's say, and dealing with deep learning for autonomous driving. All these topics can come as extras uh, on top of this, this uh, safety story. So we can now speak a bit about scheduling of these courses in, in the next uh, uh, study year. So this is the tentative plan. So the course on systems, functions, and safety starts on September the 1st as the school is starting, basically. Uh, each course start, uh, lasts for about a month, so it's four weeks course. Uh, the obligations, daily obligations are approximately two hours, so to say. Uh, you have three to four meetings with the instructors live, uh, taking uh, one and a half hours, so two classes. And then you have additional work uh, to watch some videos, resolve some quizzes, do projects, etc., like in the interactive format. Uh, and uh, yeah, after four weeks, uh, you will be given an exam. And after additional week, maybe a makeup exam if you don't make it the first time. And that closes the, the, uh, the, the course. Uh, each of the course is uh, accredited with the UCSD. So you are actually getting the UCSD points for that. This is a three unit course, the system function and safety. And then for each other course, it's a very similar story. You can see here the dates. If somebody wants to take, now we'll, let's say, uh, it is possible that you take only this one to get an overall introduction. Uh, and it would be probably enough for the first step. Uh, my recommendation would, however, be to go either these two or the best option to go with these three. So to learn the basics, the process, the ASPICE, and the, the standards. However, if you opt for all five, you will get the paper from the UCSD, uh, Functional Safety Fundamentals for Automotive. These are the certificates. Last round of students are, uh, have already earned the certificates and they are arriving in a few days uh, from, uh, from, from California. Uh, so um, if you want really to uh, have this uh, expertise, in-depth expertise on functional safety, uh, it is my uh, recommendation that you take the FSBA round of courses. So if you enroll on September the 1st, you will finish early March and that will conclude uh, the certificate and basically equip you to, to work in any, any safety critical uh, arena with full comp uh, competence. And I would say it's a, it's, it's a rare occasion that you have this available uh, in, one, in one place. So this is about the about the scheduling. Uh, how to enroll? So if you want to enroll in the functional safety base uh, uh, fundamentals for automotive, functional safety basics for automotive here FSB8, uh, it's uh, this uh, email address. Basically, you can uh, state your interest there and get all the uh, additional information. Of course, there is another route if you go through companies that already have agreements with NIT Academy and with UCSD. There might be also a different way of application. So check within your companies as well. And also, if you do have this option in the company, you can, you can check. Uh, um, it may happen that the company is fully funding this program. So just make sure to make inquiry with the HR department within the company, whether you're eligible for enrolling into this program uh, when the cost is covered by the company. However, you can always enroll individually as well. So this is also possible, in which case, uh, you can uh, make the inquiry through this email. If you're a company, also, uh, you can talk to us about this program or similar programs also through this email or uh, in any other way you feel, you feel uh, uh, appropriate. Okay, uh, before we announce the winner, we will have another last question. And now the, uh, my colleague told me that the green was actually red because the green is mechanical and the red was hardware. So we have now one one, so yellow and red is both one point. And let's see uh, the question four. The question four is uh, one question that is intended for everyone. And it will pop up in a second.
Okay, we will end the poll, share the result. Okay, so most of you got it right, basically, yes. So everybody in the company shall be knowledgeable in safety and nurture the safety culture. So uh, if you have a particular, uh, if you have a particular uh, view on safety and have only safety managers and QA people attending the safety, uh, then uh, everyone else is going to have really hard time following and they are going to have really hard time implementing this and they will resort to faking safety reports so don't let them uh, go down that route uh, many safety managers are very inclined towards adjusting a bit you know to, to to make sure the audits are passed because everyone looks to those safety uh, persons uh, for the audits and for everything and actually it's not about them it's about the complete organization it's it starts from the management and drills down to all the roles in the in all the process but ends with every leaf so with every developer and with every person in the company so it's this is this is why basically it's important that everyone understands this uh and we can attest to the results here we have two winners so both the yellow and red teams are the winners uh, because we have uh, a tie and it will not be resolved so the software people are a bit behind but uh, uh, I, I think uh, they, they also uh, did a really good job in this webinar so thanks a lot for attending and i hope you got uh, a lot of interesting insights uh, from this uh, webinar and uh, i will now uh, let uh, everyone ask questions uh, first let's attend to the questions that came through the chat uh, what approach do Japanese manufacturers use? I think it's much similar to the European uh, manufacturers. Uh, every single company uh, now faces the problems with the ship, uh, chip uh, shortage and also cutting the funds a bit uh, on some uh, high-end research. But still, the level two is under heavy development. So uh, everyone is uh, aiming to have level two autonomy, these assistive functions in every single car and there's tons of work for in in the sense of design and implementation uh, regarding the safety critical uh, safety critical things and these automotive functional safety standards ISO 26262 and everything else so I think it's a let's say uh, needed more than ever to really grasp these standards because there's still very much used across across every every uh, company every serious traditional OEM is the programming included in the courses? Do you have, for example, some topics about safety and security? Okay, so in the uh, in the FSBA program, security is uh, attended uh, as a part of uh, some of the courses. So to one to some extent, the systems function and safety, and also in fault tolerant systems. Uh, there is no dedicated course on security, but we are preparing the dedicated course in NIT Academy that is called Cybersecurity Fundamentals. Uh, that is going to be very relevant for. Uh, going hand in hand with the with, with safety and of course uh one good thing is that once you learn about safety integrity you will also be very familiar with the security integrity that is also the counterpart in security also hazard evaluation and risk assessment in security is called trap evaluation and risk assessment tara instead of hara etc so there are a lot of a lot of common common stuff that that you can regard uh programming is included in functional safety software course in all other courses, we have, uh, let's say, programming uh, parts that are optional, and we give points for students that take these programming exercises. However, the system safety is functional safety in general is not about the programming, it's about the approach. It's about the system design, it's about the uh, top level things, the architecture, so we really need the brains to, to, uh, to do that. So the programming is just one of the tools. Uh, it is uh, only a part of functional safety standards and as such is also handled in our programs as being a part. If the question is uh, whether uh, non-programmers can attend, I would warmly welcome all non-programming people to attend to these courses because these are suitable for non-programming uh, people. Uh, it is good to have engineering background because in, a, in effect uh, the engineering uh, background is needed. It is also good to have a little bit uh, stronger side on maths. 
uh, probability and these kind of things for being able to grab some simple calculations that are going to happen here and there. Uh, but in general, uh, the programming uh, is not the core part of it, but I would say that today looking at around the safety critical industries, uh, the more manual programming you have, the worse the outcome on the safety. So it's the, uh, but it's, it's definitely uh, something more than programming. And it, I wouldn't say that this safety story is alternative to programming. So if you're a programmer, now you don't need this safety story. I would say that this safety story is, is a, a super set that is very, very much needed for software people because you are the most, uh, we are, because I'm also a software guy, we are the most uh, dangerous ones because we don't have a clue. And that can be really a problem. Uh, okay, how will the sessions be organized online, live, and possible penalties in case of drop off due to unpredictable circumstances? Um, okay, so uh, basically, uh, it, it comes down to uh, our policies at the NIT Academy that we can, uh, of course, if you, if you write to us, we can uh, give you more details. Usually, if it's unpredictable circumstance, being that uh, major force or something like this, of course, there are no penalties, but whatever those might mean. If it means whether you get your money back or something like this, there are even policies that are specified. There's always ways how to retrieve your cash back if something is not okay. Uh, we usually have this, uh, let's say, money back guarantee in case you are not able to follow through the course and you figure it out in the first week in these intensive courses, you can drop out without any without any any payment so this is this is one of the one of the things uh, if you're thinking about different arrangements with your company etc this is for what you need to consult the company and the hr and what are the contractual obligation if they if the company pays you the uh, uh the enrollment in this program it's really uh, between you and your company and uh, not discussed with the ucsd directly the sessions last year were organized online. Uh, it works very, very good. Uh, and uh, this year, it will depend on the, uh, on, the, on the group formation. So the deadline uh, for the enrollment that I didn't write in slides, now, now I see that, is uh, July the 15th. So I would write, so the July the 15th. Um, I'm speaking about systems, functions, and safety course there, but anyone who wants FSBA in any format should really uh, be there at September the 1st. So shouldn't take any other course before taking this first one. Uh, July 15th is when we will uh, try to close the, uh, uh, to, to, to close the application. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically that is it. Well, let me just see. Okay, it might happen that if we have uh, participants from uh, one side, let's say Novi Sad, that we can organize a hybrid mode or even the exclusive live group in case uh, participants want to do that. Uh, we have a very nice classroom. I'm currently uh, in this classroom at the uh, Science and Technology Park in Novi Sad that I think it would be really good to discuss live if this is possible uh, in terms of organization. Uh, I will know that after the uh, July 15th. Uh, however, if you opt for an online presence, uh, it is def definitely going to be served. So we will provide you with the option to, to connect online regardless. How early late should one apply? So the July 15th, as I said, is the, is the deadline. Uh, whether we are going to grant any extensions, it's uh, uh, questionable. Uh, it may happen, but uh, I would really uh, want at least that you express the interest so that we have the, the, the indication at least on, on, on the enrollment because we need to communicate with the UCSD uh, course office and uh, they need to set up the full quarter in time. Okay, so these are all questions from the chat. Uh, do we have any questions uh, to be asked live by the audience? I think everyone asked whatever was meant to be asked. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, if you uh, filled in the survey monkey here, check the link again. So I think Elena shared it a few minutes ago. You have it up the chat. Um, 
uh, fill it in. Uh, we will uh, consult uh, this database when, if you enroll, then we can grant you a discount. It will be a 20% discount for the regular price. The regular prices you can see at the UCSD uh, uh, website for the Functional Safety Fundamentals for Automotive Program. And uh, of course, you can contact us also for detailed pricing. And whatever uh, are the official prices, 20% discount applies for people that filled in the survey monkey that will be closed after this session. So you can still fill it in. You we'll keep it open until 4.30. So it will, it will still be up. Uh, okay. Uh, having said that, I would like to thank you for your time and uh, your attention. And yeah, let's, let's stay safe and let's uh, do this uh, in, in the right way, as I said in the beginning. And uh, yeah, we'll see uh, each other uh, in the UCSD courses this fall, hopefully. Goodbye. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.